All right, great. So again, uh, just to echo what Garrett just said, thanks to the whole BITS team for putting together a great event. And thanks to all of you for attending. A lot of people flew in from far away. And uh, it was great just to spend time together. And I saw lots of interesting, interesting sounding conversations and coffee breaks and lunch. So I know there's, there's going to be a lot of uh, really good follow up from this meeting, um, as, there, as there always seems to be. Uh, what we've had as a tradition in BITS uh, annual meetings and, and training meetings is an open session at the end of half an hour, 20 minutes, 40 minutes, whatever we feel like to um, have a little bit of reflection on, on the couple days and uh, discussion about next steps, next steps for the network. BITS is a network of, of researchers and people interested in uh, open science and um, you know, usually at these meetings, definitely for me, there's always one or two issues that really jumped out or new ideas that I didn't know about that are really going to change the way that I uh, do my own research. So one of the things I wanted to do is open it up for uh, that kind of general discussion uh, here at the end to see if there's some themes maybe that folks heard in, in multiple papers throughout the last couple days or, or discussions or open questions that uh, that you think would be useful for the group left here to uh, to chat about. Any any thoughts or? Well, I'm going to take notes. <laughs> or any thoughts on any thoughts on on things you heard about in the last couple of days that you think would be useful for bits to put more time, energy, and effort into into developing uh, as well. Yeah, Amelia? So maybe one thing that I think arose out of um, the internal um, the internal replication paper, and that sort of strengthened some of the things that I think about and that I feel like I see a lot in, um, in organizations that work with data, is um, taking, taking reproducibility a step before the, you know, a little bit further, so a lot, some of the, I think, um, sort of 3IE push button replication initiatives are really, really useful, um, but sometimes they don't include the, the code that generates the actual data set, right? And so I think that's uh, another space where, where there's a lot of room for improvement and where um, helping build the capacity for organizations who, for example, work with research assistants who do a lot of the data cleaning, so helping build capacity for for organizations to document their data cleaning process better, right? I think that's another, it's a step that we don't talk as much about because we tend to think about the analysis as being where the, the p-hacking happens, but it's not, you know, whether it's p-hacking or sort of undocumentable steps in the, in the process, I think. It's, it's something I think about. To piggyback on that, I think one of the uh, when Sean and I led this discussion at the end of the London uh, workshop, one of the two like major small concrete takeaways that we could do is at the very least creating a list of organizations that actually do internal pre-publication replication. And so JPAL now does that for its affiliate researchers and uh, one attendee worked for uh, some like it's not the White House Office of Science, Technology, and Policy, but it's something like that that does that. So at least putting a list together of those organizations that do that. Um, mm. And I didn't mention it in my citations slides, but uh, I was told I should, so I will next time, which is that political science journals actually do that. So Amer the American Journal of Political Science actually now sends it out to this, the Odom Institute and verifies before publication that you get the results in the paper. So mm -hmm. that's a, like a list of organizations and some sort of work around that, like best practices in doing that internal replication. That's something we might be able to put together. Mm -hmm. Great. This is just more of a general like, overall impression comment, but something that's really struck me from seeing these presentations from different disciplines is how um, different disciplines seem to be kind of on the forefront or ta like spending a lot of energy to tackle different elements of, the, um, of open science. And so it's been interesting to see how I think that we have a lot to learn from each other of putting together some of these 
um, some of these advances that are coming in one discipline that, um, you know, for example, with the internal replication presentation, it struck me that um, the process that they're doing, it seems really incredible, and then combining that with like some of the work from Declare Design of actually producing the data set, bringing those together would create this really amazing way to go about um, you know, how we plan and design our studies. And so that's just something that's really struck me over the past few days. That, that's a great point, Rekha. I think the first BITS meeting was five years ago, and we had a few economists, a few political scientists, a few psychologists, a few bi biostatisticians in the room, and a few others. And we had that same feeling. Basically, what you articulated was sort of the essence of the, the first meeting of BITS, where um, you know, the psychologists were saying, wow, economists are so far ahead of us. They're, you know, they're posting their data online or journals are mandating it. But we we're like, well, but we're so be behind psychology in this dimension. And so every field has sort of taken the lead on certain things. But when we pull together what different fields are doing, you get a, a much better sense of the whole picture and what real, open, reproducible, transparent social science could look like. And um, so that, I, I echo that completely. That's one of the things I love about these meetings. Um, so I really enjoyed uh, yesterday's p-value discussion and one thing I thought was that actually rather than discussing, well, finding out what's the right thing to do, it really had to do in a sense with the world view of the people, like in general, do we need, a, do people function better when they have a clear rule or mm -hmm. is it better to trust them to do something that is reasonable and that will work? And I guess it's too easy to say this is just an uh, empirical question as to what people will do because we, we have to do something, um, which was also said. But so I guess this comment by itself might not be very useful, but one thing that I often think when I talk to people that are not that are a bit skeptic of adopting transparency, I think often they get very defensive because they feel like we, I am criticizing their work and their practices. And I think many people have done very reasonable work just not using these practices. And these practices might sometimes not be necessary if someone is very rigorous and experienced in doing what they're doing, but not everyone is doing so. So that's why I guess I just thought that it's a very important thought to keep in mind what, what we think people will do under certain circumstances. Mm -hmm. Thanks. I wonder if, if um, others, just while we're on the, the, the discussion of the p-values, that was sort of your opening, if others had other, well, we'll hear from Jane next, but maybe if others have thoughts on the, the aftermath, or I know there was a lot of conversation about it, that would be a nice thing for us to discuss as a group. Did, did having that discussion lead to maybe more consensus in this group about 0 0.05, 0 0.005, something else entirely? Or are we all still scratching our heads and trying to figure out where we stand? And I, I definitely heard a lot of that last point, but maybe, maybe if others have thoughts on the aftermath of that discussion, it would be a neat place to have a little bit of a, a debrief now. But go ahead, Jane. Yeah, um, I think BITS has done a good job in developing training materials for research transparency and uh, reproducibility that we're using in the training. But uh, I think BITS should go ahead and also develop materials for uh, qualitative research. I think it was mentioned briefly yesterday, because as we go training, uh, qualitative researchers always point out that uh, what we train does not actually speak to them, and yet they also need to practice transparent research. So I think we need to have specific training materials for that category of researchers. Yeah, thank you. Did someone say they want to vote on p-values? <laughs> is this like the bits? Uh, this is like the Congress or something? We're gonna. Let's do. I, I'm interested in a show of hands. Well, there's three three options: 0 0.05, 0 0.005, or s don't know something else. Maybe three categories. Head What's that? Head the yeah. Is that okay? are those three okay categories? Well, we may ask some of the others to say what their position is, or we don't want to. Uh, do, we, do we want to do this, or is this going <laughs> to... It's just a show of hands, and this, the video is aimed at, the, is, uh, at only Ted, so it's not <laughs> capturing anyone, everyone in the audience. So, yeah, keep it at 0 0.05. 0 0.05, that's like four, okay. Uh, reduce to 0 0.005. 
Okay, somewhere. No one. Okay, and okay. There's two. Two back here. Two back, oh yes. Okay, the two. Yes. Okay. Or then. Uh, and then something else. Or don't know. Did something else slash don't know. Okay. So. <laughs> That's like way. Yes. Way too. Big. We're just setting up the next meeting next year. We're gonna have to have people back to keep discussing. Well, the one thing I'll add to that is I know at least one author on one of the papers, and I won't say which, who did it just for the sake of having this conversation. So I think that's the win, that the mindlessness of, of whatever solution you want is seemingly going away. So I think that's a positive conclusion I'll throw out on this. Yeah. Um, the two things that I'd be really keen, first of all, thanks again to Bits, as well as including Jen. Uh, for a great meeting. Uh, it's another, I've really enjoyed it again year on year. Two lenses that I think would be really helpful both for the meeting and uh, training going forward. Um, one, organizational psychology in the sense that I think uh, there's a lot of interest in this movement going forward of the institution at which researchers work as the setting of intervention, be it the internal replications, computational reproducibility, hiring, promotion, tenure, and getting those who really know how organizations work and what their thoughts would be on getting those kinds of changes would be really interesting. And then the second, I'd be really keen to learn more about myself as uh, our legal scholars. Uh, I think there's a lot with publishing and what different open access agreements or other publishing agreements entail and knowing that there's sort of a war front there right now in this movement and data sharing and proprietary data. So it's not just normative expectations, what journals allow, but sometimes even clients that people are doing work for. Good reasons and bad reasons, as with anything. And I think getting some sort of legal perspective on some of those issues, I'd really enjoy learning more about that because I'm very ignorant in that space. So uh, if anyone has any ideas on either of those two fronts, I'd be welcome for those kinds of suggestions for speakers in the future. Thanks. So I guess following up a bit on the, the discussion of p-values, I, I think a conversation that I'd like to see happen more within our disciplines is when we're thinking about especially issues of pre-registration, thinking more in terms of diagnosticity of our p-values in our inferentials and understanding that that's a more continuous measure, that there is a continuum of more exploratory to confirmatory findings, uh, because I, I, I think Dichotomizing it has been useful for understanding it and getting our feet wet and understanding things. But I, I think to promote more pre-registration, for instance, recognizing that there is this continuum, uh, you don't have to have the perfect everything planned in advance to gain greater diagnosticity, the diagnosticity of our inferentials uh, would, would help people to, to do it more and maybe pulls less for if it's not perfect, then I shouldn't do it at all. Uh, and I think thinking about our analyses on more of a continuum of constraint or data independence uh, would be useful for kind of understanding what it is we're really doing and, and maybe help promote people to take more incremental steps uh, towards more constraint in analysis. Mm -hmm. So I don't know what that looks like, but talking about that more would be helpful. I think that's useful. And people have, certainly the point is, is being made by advocates of pre-registration and pre-analysis plans that we want to move away from you know, it's either perfect or zero, but I, the way you framed it was nice in saying like there is a continuum between uh, pre-specified versus exploratory work. You can, you know, slightly modify some analysis for some very good reason and still very close to what was pre-specified. And that's a different sort of analysis than something completely exploratory. And it isn't always framed that way. So uh, that, that's a useful distinction to make, yeah. Uh, thank you. Um, one of the points that I missed uh, in this meeting is the voice of the uh, research organizations that are not necessarily academic. Um, because in most cases, you have these research organizations are uh, receiving funding from uh, sponsors and they are supposed to carry out research. But in most cases, they, along the way, they modify um, the you know implementation plan and all of those things. So I'm um, thinking maybe if we could get some form of voice from their side, 
Uh, because in most cases, when they modify, then they are supposed to do like an amendment to the protocol or something like that. And in most cases, they are guided by um, uh, DSMBs. And in most cases, there's some sort of a competing interest between the principal investigator and the sponsor, the person who has the money or the organization, mm -hmm. and then the organization itself. So I wish we could get some sort of voice from you know, this organization, maybe for the next meeting, to mm -hmm. see what are the dynamics and then like, what do we need to address, which at what point do we need to you know, mm -hmm. address these kinds of power plays. Thank you. Thank you. Can, you. can you mention while you still have the mic, what a good example of a couple of organizations that would be useful to have in the room might be, Damazo? So, uh, thank you so much. I, I come from a public health uh, background and I have previously worked with uh, uh, organizations that are supported by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Mm -hmm. And uh, I will give you, um, so from Uganda, for instance, we have a research institutions, there are some are like the Infectious Diseases Institute, which is not necessarily academic, the mm. mild medicine, uh, person and all those things. Mm. But I gave you some examples where um, you, I know, uh, a research is funded uh, with uh, a protocol, with a pre, uh, you know, a pre specified analysis plan. But along the way, during the implementation, maybe because, uh, uh, because uh, the, the, the there are changes during the implementation process. Mm. You are required either to change the p-values, you are required to change the sample size, you are required to reduce you know, some of these uh, things, maybe even the, the monitoring time. But as you change some of these things, then several things do happen. Mm. Okay. So the key question here is the, the, the organization wants to you know, please the sponsor, the sponsor wants the results, so yeah, this, yeah. you know, and then the PI, of course, the principal investigator also wants some money, sure. but then he must bend some rules here and there. So I'm just wondering what is the voice of these kinds of organizations? Oh, hope that makes sense. Yeah. Well, it sounds like a setting maybe where the donor has a lot of leverage over, from yes. what you're saying, over exactly. design, implementation, analysis, and then how do we fit transparency and open science in that? Setting. I mean, I, in theory, certain aspects, say pre-specification, could be very useful for researchers in that sort of setting if they and the donor could agree to analysis plans before results are realized, if, if the donor has an interest in a certain set of results. So at least in theory, there could be an upside. But in reality, I think how, how the dynamics work out, as you said, are something that need to be explored. One of the things that sort of come out uh, in, in many presentations, um, all of the uh, tools and ideas and practices that, that we've discussed um, are sort of directly addressing these questions. But one of the other cool things about this group is that this is a set of people who are in their own disciplines uh, trying to make change and make, make these change, make these practices and tools be adopted. I feel like one of the kinds of knowledge that, that we could harness better is the ways in which people have gone about doing that and how they've been successful and, and, and when they failed. So there have been, almost every presentation has been about some, some new uh, innovation that, that, that you're trying to implement. And so thinking about how, how you've spoken to journal editors about implementing some of these tools, mm -hmm. um, thinking about how, to, how, how people have gotten their professional associations to, um, to include these, et, et cetera. I, I think we've gotten a lot of those answers on the periphery, but I think it's a, it's a kind of a fountain of knowledge here about those, those issues. That's great. And, you know, one thing, I wonder if the BITS team has anything to add to this, but one very natural outlet for that kind of knowledge would be the BITS blog. And, you know, to the extent that there were points that came up in your own talk or in others' talks that sparked thinking along the lines of what Graham was saying, you know, oh, this is how we overcame a certain problem. This is how we got a journal to sign on to a certain set of policy changes. I'm thinking of, like, Abel's work on the, you know, the editorial statement, like how did that happen? That's a cool change. I think to the extent that anybody's interested in writing a short blog, um, okay, it's locked, uh, sorry, a short um, blog post, I think the Bits blog is a really natural forum that would reach a couple thousand interested, like-minded um, people. So please do let us know if, if you do have interest in, in producing something short on your own experience, your success, your failures. I don't know if anybody on the BITS team, I don't know if, if Jen or Kelsey want to add anything to that. Or.
Great. And you know, Jen mentioned the Catalyst program. So a number of you in the room are already Catalysts, but stay in touch with us if you have a training, teaching, workshop, curriculum development, mission that you want to sort of set out on because we can figure out how BITS can potentially help you with that in your own discipline. Hi, I'm David from the Basara Center of Economics, of Behavioral Economics. We're a research firm based in Nairobi, Kenya. Uh, and this has been really helpful, uh, so thank you for inviting us. But uh, one sort of process, or one component of research that we haven't really touched on is, and this may be specific to sort of the work that we do, but is sort of implementation on the ground and transparency around that implementation. Uh, so for instance, in lab or lab in the field or field experiments, it's like, hundreds of decisions that you're making on a daily basis. And so what is the process of making that transparent? And, and, and it's a difficult, I think it's a difficult question because the only, I think the only reasonable way you could do that is making communication on projects open. Uh, so that would be say communication between the PI and the research assistant, or between the research assistant and the field teams. Because there's, and I say, and I think it sort of serves multiple reasons. One is uh, in terms of making people more responsible in the decisions that they make, uh, also adding credibilities to sort of your research design. But thirdly, and most importantly, I think it sort of adds to, um, to not reinventing the wheel. Because in our context, uh, a lot of instruments, for instance, just a basic example is a lot of instruments do not work, right? Uh, and so, uh, and then you have a new sort of PI come in and sort of do the same exercise over again, and their instrument doesn't work, and sort of you need these knowledge transfers, and how do you make that knowledge institutionalized is a problem, right? And and one way to do that would be to make uh, communications on projects open, but I don't know if a good way to do that or what the process would be. Yeah, it's, it's an interesting idea. I think the ideal, the ideal sounds very appealing. I, I, we might come into a situation with large projects and large teams and lots of communication where the sort of flood of communication anybody interested in understanding the project would have to go through would be so large that it might be hard to get the information they want. But, we, but you're totally right that too seldom in our field projects do we distill those key field design issues and instrument design issues and sampling issues uh, into something useful. It's, it's just sort of in the background of most of our field RCTs. I think that's, that's totally right. Um, I don't know if anybody else in the audience has thoughts about that other than diligently trying to document our key decisions, sharing them as an appendix. Some of us do that to some extent, but probably in too impressionistic a way rather than uh, hard data. Yeah. Yeah, um, one of the things that I've been uh, very pleasantly surprised um, to see is, is rigorous evidence of um, the impact of uh, some of the um, uh, open science um, uh, practices and techniques uh, you, some of which, you, some, some of the studies actually use um, uh, the very techniques and practice that, that um, we're advocating as well. Like, you know, so, so I'm thinking about the, um, the publication bias uh, study um, and the data sharing and citations um, study. So I think one of the, uh, you know, providing rigorous evidence uh, of the impact of some of these practices and in fact showing that we benefit from them is, I think, particularly important because you know, we all know that um, one of the big problems that we face is incentives and, you know, what is, what is in it for, for me, what is it for the research community to, to adopt these practices. Um, and I think there's sometimes a risk that we're, we're appealing to people's sort of, you know, moral compass, you know, you're, I feel guilty that I'm not doing it. But, you know, if we can actually show them uh, rigorously that this is, this is not just, you don't need to feel bad, actually, it's in your, your rational self-interest to, to adopt these. You know, we all benefit from it. Um, it might actually bring more attention to our research. It might uh, increase our citation counts. It actually, from broader, you know, not, not just my own, uh, it not, doesn't just benefit me, but also um, uh, the types of papers that are uh, getting published. Um, there are broader benefits for the research community. This kind of um, impact assessment, uh, I think, is particularly helpful and uh, allows us to actually, I think maybe could, could have a um, uh, you know, particularly powerful impact on 
the adoption of these sorts of practices. I think that's a new thing. I think in the last few years, th these are new studies, and you're totally right that, again, at the first BITS meeting five years ago, around the same time Center for Open Science and some other initiatives were launching four or five years ago, it was um, a bit of an article of faith that there would be benefits for science from engaging in these, you know, adopting these practices and, and a strong sense of what was right or what fit the scientific ethos. But um, we can marry that now with, with some data. That's, that's really powerful. I think you're right. Yeah. Just one thing I would like to learn more about it's it, um, that piggybacking a little bit on the um, being more clear on data sharing. Um, the, the whole world of uh, administrative data or highly sensitive data that it cannot be shared for, for obvious uh, reasons, um, but that it tends to be at least in, in, in what I'm familiar with the research in Chile is that there's a few researchers, if you have the right contacts, you can access the data and, and can like, do the right studies. Uh, that, and doing those studies is great, it's a great contribution to knowledge, but then uh, there's, there's not a trail of how to systematically access that data. Even if, it's, even if you have to go to a cold room or follow some, some procedures, kind of like standardizing the access to highly sensitive data or administrative data, I think it's something that's pretty well in line with uh, mm -hmm. what we're discussing here. Yeah, especially given the rising share of papers, at least in, I know in economics, that use proprietary data or government data with restricted access. So it's a, every year that goes by, kind of an increasingly important issue in our, in our work and really limits reproducibility if no one else can touch the data, right? So. The census is working on that with a team at Cornell. So there's the, in the US, there's the federal statistical research data centers, and they're at least going to have soon DOIs for the metadata, which would at least tell you, like, these are the restricted data sets, and then there is, it's the government, so it's a long process to get access, but you could, like, if you have s special sworn status with the census, you could, like, this DOI in the research data center would resolve to like actual access to the data. So there is progress, hopefully, or there will be. Yeah, I, I think just to follow up on that, because I have a lot of conversations now that JPL has been doing a lot more work in North America. We're starting to have a lot more administrative data, court records, things of that sort that wouldn't probably be part of the US census data, but I've been having conversations with people, with, with researchers who do want to publish or make their data accessible in some way or another and can't convince their partner that they can make this data available, whether it's in a restricted access repository on ICPSR or some other location. It's the conversations that need to be had with partners that is, is challenging sometimes. So I think you know, I don't, I don't know where to go from there, but, you know, how to con have uh, interesting conversations with, with partners or to, to build that relationship with the partners so that they will understand the importance of kind of making this data accessible to other researchers. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. All right, I'm not sure if there's anything else. Um, it was a really great meeting. Maybe a round of applause again for all the presenters, participants, BIT staff. <laughs> and thanks, too, for the folks who've been helping us uh, film all of this. So another round of applause. Thank you. Um, and we'll see you guys hopefully soon at another training course, another annual meeting. Stay in touch. Blog. Become a catalyst. And, and generally, let's, let's all be in touch. Uh, this is an increasingly strong research network and community, and it's really exciting to see it year on year just grow and get stronger. So uh, congratulations to all you guys. So.